T-minus 4 minutes, 20 seconds and counting. The firing circuit for the solid rocket boosters ignition and range safety destruct devices uh, have been armed by the ground launch sequencer command. This is accomplished with a motor-driven switch called a safe and arm device. The system is then inhibited to prevent premature ignition until T-minus 10 seconds. T-minus 4 minutes and counting. From the NASA select cameras at the Kennedy Space Flight Center in Florida, and from our amateur television master control at the Goddard Space Flight Visitor Center outside Washington, in the facilities of the Amateur Satellite Corporation. Good morning, this is Bruce WA9GVK, and I'm here with Dave W3PJM from the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, and we're here today to bring you the STS-9 mission all the way from the launch throughout its entire nine days showing you inside scenes from the space shuttle and laboratory all the way down to the landing. This is kind of a historic transmission for us here on Fast Scan Amateur Television. It was made possible through an FCC report and order which allowed us to retransmit the NASA collected video from the space shuttle uh, over amateur television. As you can see behind us, it's kind of a rainy, bleak day here at Goddard, but we hope to present to you some real exciting pictures. Um, this morning we'll see them from uh, Florida, and as the mission progresses, we will be uh, seeing scenes inside the space shuttle itself. Again, helping out here is uh, Dave, W3PJM, who came up all the way from Akakeek, Maryland, to play with the cameras and uh, put all the wires together. <laughs> I, uh, I hate to pan the camera below uh, because we really have quite, a, quite an array of wires here and I'm about ready to get electrocuted, I think. This is the station setup we're using to beam our pictures into the amateur TV repeater in Alexandria via the antenna on the roof. Well, it looks like we're about ready for the liftoff, so we'll switch you right now down to Florida. Coming up on the one minute point, and the firing system for the sound suppression water system is armed. T minus one minute and counting. The hydrogen igniters under the orbiter's engines have now been armed. These devices are used to ensure that any hydrogen flowing through the engines prior to ignition does not accumulate. T minus 45 seconds. 14 seconds away from switching command uh, to the onboard computers. The Space Lab countdown is now complete. Coming up on the 30-second point, and we go for auto-sequence start. The SRB hydraulic power units have started. These move the solid motor nozzles to steer the vehicle. T-minus 20 seconds, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 10. We have go for main engine start, 8, Seven, six, we have main engine start, three, two, one, solid motor ignition, and liftoff. Liftoff of Columbia and the first flight of the European Space Agency Space Lab. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Pressure roll. The vehicle rolling from tail south around 235 degree azimuth northeast. Roger. Roger. We sure hope that you're receiving these pictures at home as good as we're seeing them here at Goddard. Uh, right now as an amateur TV exclusive, uh, we're going to be repeating the liftoff, but this time from several different camera angles. While we do that, we're also going to be talking with the head of the Goddard Visitor Center, uh, Mr. Ed Pearson, who stopped by our booth to give us some more background on the shuttle mission. Ed 
And what function does Goddard perform for the space shuttle program? Well, for the space shuttle, we have uh, two two major jobs here. For the in general, we provide tracking for all. Uh, space shuttle flights and then provide the communications to the Johnson Space Center where they have the Mission Operations Center. And then for this mission going on, the, the Space Lab, we're responsible for what they call the Space Lab Data Processing Facility, which captures all the data for Space Lab, reformats it, and then sends it out to the investigators so they can analyze the data on, on their individual computers worldwide. Now, in terms of the signals that we're transmitting to the folks right now, exactly how are we getting that from the space shuttle? Well, my understanding is the, the, the space shuttle is sending the data up to our tracking data relay satellite. This is a project that we have in orbit, uh, geosynchronous orbit, 22,300 miles up over the coast uh, of Brazil. And then from the TDRA satellite, we send the data down to the White Sands, New Mexico facility. Hi there. <laughs> we, got, we, got some, yeah. we got an audience yeah. here today. <laughs> and then from White Sands, the, the, uh, the video is sent to the Johnson Space Center. From Johnson, it is then sent up to uh, what we call a DOMSAT. It's a, a satellite uh, really owned by RCA, and then NASA leases it. And then. Uh, but behind the woods here, they pick up that signal from the DOMSAT. They send it over to our our uh, operations building, which is building 14 here at Goddard. 14 sends it up here to the visitor center. I send it over to you. Then we use the uh, the antenna on top of this building to send it to the repeater in Alexandria, where uh, amateur uh, TV enthusiasts can, can see it. We're now anxiously awaiting for the first TV pictures to be received from the shuttle as it approaches the United States. NASA has informed us that there may be a slight time difference between the audio and video circuits. You reported an I.O. error, PCM, and no data. And we just wanted to find out if the, if the no data pertains to the space lab only or was there also orbiter data missing as well? Well, it's orbiter data as well, and we did all reset, execute, and it all came back. Go ahead, Owen. The picture we're getting now is really outstanding. Really fantastic. Much better than what we thought we would get. This is really quite an exciting moment for us here at Amateur Television. Now looking at the mid-deck airlock, uh, Brewster Shaw pilot just uh, placing his hand on the airlock uh, hatch. Now looking back in the payload bay uh, at the Space Lab module, it's located toward the rear for center of gravity reasons. A long tunnel proceeding from the airlock to the Space Lab module. On our monitor here, we see that the astronauts are apparently having difficulty getting the hatch to the air tunnel open. Crew now has the hatch open. Franklin, uh, we've got the uh, airlock hatch to the uh, mid-deck open, and uh, we're proceeding down in still step nine. Roger Owen, we're getting a very good TV picture down here. In Columbia, Houston, we can see you coming down the tunnel. You got about 11 and a half more minutes of TV coverage. Welcome to Space Lab. Okay. Left of the field is you, uh, mission specialist Owen Garriott, and to the right, payload specialist Byron Lichtenberg, followed by a European Space Agency payload specialist Ulf Merbold, now in the Space Lab module for the first time. Here, get into the Space Lab on the monitor. Hey, Houston, you can see all the way down the tunnel, and see him working in the Space Lab from the uh, mid-deck. John, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. There appears to be some artistic talent on board Space Lab. Uh, someone has configured the tunnel entrance into what appears to be a 
shark. First, perhaps Jaws is on board. Over 40 scientific investigations will be conducted in Space Lab on this mission. Several experiments are now being performed to investigate how liquids behave in zero gravity. They're trying to find out, for example, if liquids will tend to stick to the container sides, move to the center, or disperse, filling with air bubbles. One application of the research is in the design of rocket propellant tanks. That reservoir, when it was launched, because uh, either that or it uh, moved and expanded because um, I didn't suck any fluid in except I could see what I was doing when I did Mike Haynes' run, so that uh, I was pretty sure that I didn't suck any air in it, but uh, there's quite a bit in there, obviously. Okay, Baron, um, I've seen this and copied it. Um, I think the thing to do now is to wind down on this one and start um, 329 option B, but I'm afraid it involves a reservoir change. I know you don't want this, but um, it's impossible to run the experiment without the five centistokes, no tracers. Byron Lichtenberg uh, running the fluid physics uh, demonstration that he had promised the uh, material science people here in the payload operations control center. And uh, Space Lab for Byron, we're getting a terrific uh, live TV of that uh, uh, FBM uh, cartridge there. And uh, Space Lab, uh, we're looking at some AEPI data. And that's a beautiful picture we see on MTV. I'm correction, that's uh, AEPI TV. And the uh, AEPI uh, camera out on the pallet, uh, documenting uh, air glow from uh, the Earth's atmosphere. The payload control center. Dr. Steve Mindy and his research team uh, okay. monitoring that data. We must be seeing the uh, limb in uh, 2800, and uh, it is not quite clear at the moment to me why we, there is such a distinct uh, double uh, layer, but uh, we are looking towards the sun, uh, and uh, they are, um, uh, it, it must be the magnesium layer um, above, and uh, the, maybe the ozone layer below. Uh, it's a little off, not clear why we see two layers. Steve Mendy reporting uh, he's getting some unexpected data on this uh, live downlink of uh, atmospheric air glow. Before we continue with the next experiment, we have to show you what's going on outside our amateur TV control booth window here at the Goddard Space Flight Visitor Center. Elementary and high school students from the area have been invited here to launch their own model rockets. They've told me that these rockets do reach altitudes of about 1,500 feet. So it's kind of interesting that we have the rare opportunity today to observe both ends of the spectrum of the American space program. Okay, we're going to take you back now to the space shuttle. The hop and drop experiment is about ready to begin. During this first portion of the experiment operation, the period will begin with a cycle of 30 cycles of hops, followed by 15 drops from the T-handle. The hop and drop experiment measures the response of the leg muscles. When one falls on Earth, our muscles have a tendency to tighten right before we hit ground. Scientists are trying to determine if the same tightening occurs in weightlessness. Electrodes have been connected to Owen Garriott's legs to measure his muscle response. During the drop portion, Garriott indicates his readiness by depressing a red button on the end of the handle. That signals to the computer take over and the drop, the drop then occurs at a random time between one and six seconds and Garriott has just experienced his second drop. During the drop, the accelerometer unit at the back of the head measures acceleration and when he contacts the floor, the foot switch signals to the computer that the drop has been completed. 
completed. You're probably really puzzled about this experiment. In it, the astronaut is wearing a special contact lens with five lines drawn on it, and he's now looking into a rotating drum and TV camera. On the drum are colored dots, which are constantly moving. Scientists on the ground are using the contact lens to determine if the eye is rotating or moving in response to the movement of the dots, in any different manner in zero gravity than on Earth. The end result is to see how eye movements affect adaptation to weightlessness. While watching all of the Space Lab experiments here via Amateur TV, we've been surprised by their varied nature, intensiveness, and quantity, as well as the great dependency mission scientists on the ground place on the TV pictures. We'd like to briefly explain how we're getting these pictures to you at home. The signal from Goddard is beamed across Washington, D.C. and on into our amateur TV repeater located atop a tall building in Alexandria, Virginia. Using an array of antennas and a conglomeration of homebrew equipment, the repeater receives, processes, amplifies, and retransmits the signal for reception throughout parts of Maryland, Washington, and in Northern Virginia. To explain how we're also sending our pictures worldwide, let's go to the home of Bob Suiting, W0LMD in Herndon, Virginia. The received television picture from the amateur television repeater is sent from this monitor over to the scan converter, which is able to hold a single picture at a time. This picture is then sent to this standard amateur transmitter, which is able to send out the picture around the world. To get the process started, I press a key on a keyboard, which commands a scan converter to begin sending out the picture over an eight second period. This is what the Bay Area of the shuttle looks like as it would be received by a distant viewer. We're now going to take a break in our space shuttle coverage to bring you some brief, non-commercial, commercial announcements. Every Sunday night at 8 o'clock, be sure to catch the weekly amateur TV news. With the help of the voices of the Westlink Amateur News Service in Los Angeles and our crack Metrovision anchor team here in Washington, we bring you a summary of the weekly happenings in the amateur radio service. This Sunday, we'll be showing a new videotape that's just arrived from Takao, JA0BZC, in Matsumoto, Nagano, Japan, under our international home video exchange program. We, uh, we visited to him, his house uh, after... Uh, You'll see the tape in its entirety next Sunday. And... Uh, as the shuttle is fast approaching the U.S., astronaut Owen Garriott is now scheduled to start operating his small, handheld amateur radio set in an historic attempt to directly contact fellow amateurs on the ground. While we keep the NASA video on the air, we're going to see if we can also pick up his signal from space directly on this scanning type receiver.
That was just a tremendous signal from the Columbia. Really surprising performance from such a small unit. But we're going to have to switch quickly back to the NASA audio circuit because mission specialist Ulf Merbold, the first non-U.S. citizen to fly in an American spacecraft, is now getting ready to talk to the U.S. ambassador to Germany. But as everybody knows, we are moving really fast and it doesn't take much time make it all the way to Europe. Come here, Thank you. We got I'm so proud to be able to say just a few words to you. We Americans are especially glad and especially proud to have you work with us Americans on this marvelous space lab. We want to congratulate you on the experiments that you've been performing and on the success that you're having. We're very proud of you. We wish you further success in your work and a very happy landing. Thanks a lot, uh, but uh, let me uh, tell you that uh, it is certainly a privilege for me to be on that very exciting mission, together with uh, distinguished people like Don Young and Don Gayot. Copy that, Ulf, and if it's possible, we'd love to have you pan the camera toward the Earth. Okay, I will try to do that for you. Well, oh, that was the wrong direction. Okay, here comes the Earth. And you see, let me, let me point it down all the way. Okay, maybe you can see how fast we go. Just crossing uh, the Isle of Ireland, and here comes England. Oh. And I guess it won't take much more time until we run into Poland. Thank you very much, Ulf. We really enjoyed the guided tour. I hope you could recognize somewhat on, the, on your television screen. It is certainly easier to see it by eye than uh, by television. The crew is now getting ready for a press conference with the President of the United States. With the shuttle flying over Europe and as part of the press conference, the European press will now be posing questions to the astronauts. Hello, this is London, Robert Walgate from the science journal Nature. Is it possible for you to tell us yet of any preliminary results that you have from your experiments on board? Well, we know for instance 
is that uh, the close spectrometer which uh, investigates the Earth's atmosphere measured very interesting um, things. We figured out uh, that um, the uh, atmosphere contains a lot of minor constituents like ozone, carbon dioxide and so on and we got very accurate information on uh, the concentration of these gases in uh, all the different layers of the atmosphere. And that is important to develop a model of the uh, atmosphere which will then predict, um, for, for instance, for um, how many more years uh, we can uh, pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere without um, impact on the climate. I thank Jim for Cole and thank you and thank you all of our astronauts. God bless you and Godspeed on your journey home. Mach 6, 120,000 feet. Columbia descending about 170 feet per second, right. 174 miles uh, from runway. Descending at uh, 200, 240 feet per second. Roger that. 77 miles from the runway. And we see Columbia. RMU officer reports three good auxiliary power units functioning properly. Mach 2.3, dropping at 200 feet per second. 52 miles from the runway. Seeing puffs of smoke from the uh, reaction control system used uh, down quite low. We have a picture from the chase plane now of the Columbia. Flight control system in automatic. Switching now to manual. And they just experienced the sonic boom. Columbia now on the heading alignment circle. Slightly different being the uh, heavyweight vehicle with its uh, payload of Space Lab, 21,000 feet. Descending at 200 feet per second, 12 miles from the runway. And we have a chase plane picture. to the uh, flare, gear coming down, gear down, and locked, and we have touchdown, unofficial touchdown time for the main gear, uh, 10.07. 4723. Nose gear coming down. And gear contact. Nose down at 10.07.47.41. And STS 9 is home from the longest shuttle mission to date.